please welcome Alan to the stage for our next talk. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate it. Um, my name is Alan Liska, uh, and I'm on Twitter at least known as the ransomware sommelier, which means that I help pair the right ransomware with the defects in your organization. Um, so if you don't have multi-factor authentication, I'll get you some lockbit. Um, if you haven't patched anything that's internet facing in two years, then maybe some Alfi to go with your uh, to go with your network. Uh, I am actually a ransomware researcher at Recorded Future, and I've written uh, either co-written or written two books about ransomware. Um, as you said, one of them's uh, available um, at our booth. Uh, feel free to stop by and grab a copy. Uh, Recorded Future is the largest threat intelligence company out there. Um, and actually, interestingly, I want to pick up where <coughs> Harlan left off in this last talk, so thank you for setting me up with that. Um, with a simple question, are ransomware attacks up or down in 2022 compared to 2021? Well, yeah, because we're, we're incentivized. Um, we make money when they're up and when people think they're up. But the question is, are they really up? Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's, that's generally the, the answer that we look at is, oh, uh, maybe. Um, now, again, playing off what Harlan said, if you're looking at ransomware extortion sites, they're up by about 50. I mean, at least according to the data that we've collected. And I know a lot of y'all collect the same data from ransomware extortion sites, and so you all will have different numbers than I have because everybody's collection's a little bit different and a little bit weird and, uh, and, and you get some things and you don't get other things and you collect from some sites and don't collect from other sites. And of course, there's also the distinction um, between, uh, uh, between do you collect from encrypt and steal data um, uh, bad guys or do you only collect Or do you, or do you uh, collect also from just steal data bad guys? Because um, I know like Mandiant, and as of today, Google, congratulations on all the Mandiant people in your stock. Um, uh, uh, I, just, you know, I, I used to work at FireEye way, way, way back in the day, and um, uh, the, the transaction just was enough to pay for uh, my wife and I to have a lovely weekend in Vermont this fall, so thank you, Google. Um, um, I, I know Google now makes a distinction between ransomware uh, gangs and multifaceted extortion groups because Mandiant always has to overcomplicate anything. And I do, I love you, Mandiant, I promise. I, I don't mean to pick on you, but that really is an excessively long name for people that steal shit. <laughs> um, but what's interesting to me is not the number of ransomware groups or, or the number of victims special to extortion sites. What's interesting to me is the number of different extortion sites that we've collected from in 2022 versus 2021. So even though there's only about 50, uh, a, a difference of 50, we're collecting from uh, 98 different sites versus 44 different sites. Why is that? Well, it's because, at least from our view, and everybody has a different view, so always keep in mind this is from our point of view and what we collect, there's a lot more ransomware variants this year than last year. So uh, in 2022, we've identified uh, 170 new ransomware variants. And yeah, a lot of those are variants of stop deja vu, which we've all decided we're not gonna care about because we can't charge thousands of dollars per hour to do incident response for stop deja vu. But there's, you know, but stop deja vu is still by far the most popular ransomware variant out there and we haven't figured out how to stop it, um, which is really sad. Um, but then again, there's still Conficker out there and there's still WannaCry out there, so why wouldn't there be stop deja vu? So we've identified 170 new ransomware variants so far in 2022, and that is compared to 183 in all of 2021. There are more ransomware variants that are out there. Now, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. 
they're not new, new ransomware variants. They're, a lot of them are using stolen code from Conti and Rebel and Chaos and so on. Um, but there are nonetheless new variants. And we're also seeing differences by sector. So by what we track, again, uh, healthcare ransomware attacks are down, local government ransomware attacks, school attacks are down. Those three are really important because they tend to make the local news, so it's hard to not notice those when they happen um, because schools get shut down, hospitals have to redirect patients. Um, as you said, people can't pay their water bill or buy mortgages. So those tend to get noticed, those tend to make the news. So we are actually seeing, um, uh, uh, we are seeing a drop in those attacks this year compared to 2021, but of course 2021 was a, like a disaster movie of ransomware. It's really funny, if you go all the way back to 2017 in January and look at news articles, um, every news article in January of, not every news article, but every year in January of that year has the previous year as the year of ransomware. And then every year it gets worse and worse and worse. I'm going to say that 2021 was probably actually the year of ransomware, although with Albania and Costa Rica and Montenegro, that may not actually be the case. Um, but, you know, again, to that point, we've seen an increase in what appear to be national government attacks, uh, construction attacks, and a big, big increase in what we would think of as small business attacks. So a lot of local real estate offices, a lot of car dealerships, um, a lot of dentist's office. So big, often big businesses for their community, but again, you can't go in and charge these people $500 an hour to do incident response, so we classify them as small businesses. Um, and so, you know, so that's kind of the mixed message that we're seeing. And then the other thing I'll say is ransomware is not just Russian now. Um, we're seeing variants out of Iran. We're seeing variants out of China. I know lapsus is kind of weird, so, but I'm going to throw it on there just because I love to take a dig at the UK. Um, and then, of course, you know, North Korea. Big surprise that... Uh, we're seeing more and more activity out of North Korea since that's the only way they can make money. Um, so, you know, we're seeing this and not all of these groups, not all of these groups have extortion sites. Not all of these groups are actually real ransomware. A lot of them are distraction campaigns and, and other things that use what appears to be ransomware. Um, but is really mostly just I'm going to encrypt your stuff kind of uh, kind of attacks. Um, so yeah, I know I'm like 15 minutes in the presentation. I really haven't gotten to the point. So I'm going to get to the point now. Um, this is this is kind of what we're seeing. Um, we're seeing more and more smaller groups that are rejecting the RAS model. So these are through, through uh, September 9th, 2021 versus you know, September 9th of 2022. This is the breakdown of what the different RAS groups looks like. And again, this is all coming from ransomware extortion sites and uh, not a perfect measure. In fact, an extremely imperfect measure, but it's a standard that we can all at least roughly agree on. If you look at the model, in 2021, Conti was the clear leader. But there were other groups that were out there that if, hey, um, you know, Conti, let's say a Ukrainian researcher infiltrates Conti and leaks all their data, where do I want to go? There were other options to go to. You could go to Rebel, you could go to Lockbit, you could go to any of these other groups that are out there. Um, and, and there was a more even distribution. In 2022, it's Lockbit or nothing. Um, and I guarantee you there are, I, I know when you asked, there was nobody from the FBI here, um, but I guarantee you there are a lot of law enforcement actors uh, uh, that are looking at Lockbit right now, and I'm guessing Lockbit is going to have a Conti moment uh, in the next couple of months, um, because you can only get so big for so long. 
And if that doesn't work, um, for those of you that follow on Twitter closely, Lockbit has been offering $1,000 for a tattoo um, of themselves. I have 20 of them um, now. Um, I'm hoping to bank from them because I have a lot of real estate. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to bankrupt them just by uh, tattooing myself with the Lockbit logo. Um, but, but this is what we're seeing right now is that, that we're moving away or we think, and as with anything up here when you talk about threat intelligence, I could come up here and say, well, we have low confidence, medium confidence, but essentially what I'm saying, everything I'm saying up here could be complete bullshit and I could be completely wrong. Um, but we do see, seem to see a pattern of new ransomware groups moving away from the RAS model. So the RAS model is what has built ransomware for the last two years. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, as, 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 as Harlan eloquently put it, that idea of, okay, cool, I can build me a ransomware and I can rent out my infrastructure. I know that's not exactly what you said, but, you know, paraphrasing. Um, that model has worked really well and it's helped ransomware grow, right? You know, that combined with Bitcoin, combined with initial access brokers, all of those things have really helped ransomware grow, but we're seeing, we're seeing a, a move, what appears to be a move away from that where too many groups are afraid to be, uh, too many of the, the, what would used to be the affiliates are afraid to be part of a big group because they've seen what's happened to Rebel. They've seen what happen what's happened to Conti. Um, they see that when these, uh, when these RAS groups get too big, they tend to come down. Um, and so they want to kind of operate on their own. They still have access to all the same infrastructure. They still have access to the initial access brokers. They still have access to um, you know, if, uh, DDoS services if they want to expand the kind of extortion they're doing. But we're finding that some of these groups prefer to work in these small four or five people uh, cells, if you will. Um, and, and that is kind of what we're seeing um, here. And, you know, it, it's the same thing a, a, as anything matures. A lot of people will still shop at Walmart, but some people like to go to their little artisanal shops. And, and again, I think that's what we're kind of seeing in this area where, yeah, you're definitely going to have... Um, we're, we're, you're definitely going to have people that are going to flock to Lockbit because Lockbit has a big name and, uh, and, and is still by far carrying out the most, at least the most publicly reported ransomware attacks that make it to extortion sites, which is a very small subset of all the attacks. Um, but, um, but again, we're seeing more and more move away from that. And as I said, just because they're moving away from those big models doesn't necessarily mean that they are building their own ransomware. Nobody's building their own ransomware from scratch anymore. Um, so we're seeing a lot of code reuse from Conti, Revo, and Chaos. Uh, how many of y'all were around in 2015 when the hidden tear code was released? Okay. Some old timers, it's nice. Um, although it's weird to consider 2015 old timer. Um, when the hidden tear code was released, we saw just a, an absolute, uh, uh, um, j just, just a huge burst of new, new ransomware uh, groups coming out because there was this readily available code that they could modify and use. And I think that's a big part of what we're seeing now is just like the RAS model made it easy for anybody who wanted to join ransomware but didn't have a ransomware group but didn't have the technical skills to kind of jump in and uh, and, and start doing that. Um, the fact that all of this code is readily available means that it's easier for groups that don't want to join a RAS group to go ahead and modify the existing code that's out there and um, and, and move to. Uh, you know, and, and move to uh, uh, start their own ransomware in that way. Um, but there is some good news. We're not seeing a lot of creativity in the attacks, right? We still see Cobalt Strike, we still see Sliver, we still see AdFind, Mimikatz, Bloodhound, lots and lots of PowerShell, all the commands that Harlan was talking about, all those commands that you can get scrape off the DFIR report, which I highly recommend everybody doing. Um, 
those, those things are still the same. The, these groups aren't necessarily coming up with new techniques. Occasionally, yes, but mostly we're seeing the same things over and over again. Um, so a lot of the same uh, techniques, detection techniques, still work. So if you're trying to stop the ransomware before your data is stolen and before your data is encrypted, you have the opportunity out there if you're doing threat hunting. However, it can be uh, a little more difficult to identify these new variants, especially because a lot of the new variants like to pretend they are something else. Um, the, uh, I mean, we saw, we've seen this with, uh, with, with, with Evil Corp, right? Evil Corp loves to use other people's ransomware because they know they're a sanctioned entity, so they like to go and they like to deploy other kinds of ransomware. They like to do anything they can to not identify themselves as Evil Corp. Um, what, you know, North Korea doesn't announce that they're carrying out ransomware attacks because they want to be able to collect the money or they at least want to give the victims plausible deniability so that they can pay. Um, not that anybody here would ever do that. But let's say unscrupulous victims who might want to pay despite the sanctions. Um, so you, with all of these new variants, with all of this new information out here, um, it can be hard if you miss the initial access, if you miss the, the reconnaissance, um, it can be really hard to find the, uh, you know, it, it can be really hard to um, determine whether or not one of these new variants is uh, from a sanctioned entity. So it is something to keep in mind. Um, and this is why I think it's more and more important to work with law enforcement. Um, and, and again, if you've been doing this for a long time, you probably kind of roll your ideas at that, and I apologize for any law enforcement here, but, but I do think uh, the FBI, I think CISA, has gotten a lot better to work with to help identify um, uh, uh, and, and work with victims. They know a lot. I mean, I know I've worked with the FBI on a lot of the uh, cases with the North Korean ransomware, especially. Um, and, you know, they're, they've been really good to work with to help make sure that you're not paying a organization that is, um, that is a shang sanctioned entity. Um, that being said, sometimes even even if you know they're sanctioned, you may have to pay and you know, accept the fine. That's just part of the risk. But generally, that's out of our hands. That's in the leadership's hands. Um, so I actually do very much encourage people to work with law enforcement whenever possible. Um, I, I do think that broadly what we're going to see in the next year or so is we're going to see a move away from these RAS groups, but we're not going to necessarily see a move away from the techniques that a lot that are used by a lot of these RAS groups. Um, and so, um, and, and and so you know we'll have all of these smaller little groups that may be more difficult to track. But if you're catching it earlier, if you're catching the attack during the initial access or during the reconnaissance phase, those methods don't look like they are evolving greatly or evolving fastly. Um, so keeping up good fundamental security practices still goes a long way to doing that. And I am one minute over, according to this. So um, thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. If you do have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and uh, if not, uh, we'll go on to the next talk. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Have you noticed any uh, impact uh, on the information sanctions against the government? Down by the ransomware ransomware? No. Um, I'm not, not that I've noticed. The other people may have different. Um, I think we've seen a bigger impact from the fact that Russia, or more importantly, Ukrainian threat actors will no longer work with Russian groups. I think that's had more of an impact than the, than the, san than the, the sanctions, especially the sanctions against uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. That being said, I think it's, 
something that is good and we should continue to do it because if we make it harder for the ransomware groups to spend their money, um, uh, then, you know, then eventually we're going to find a, uh, we're going to find a, a, a positive outcome from that. I, I kind of think of it like, I kind of think of it like whack-a-mole, you know, um, and I know that's an analogy that we use a lot in uh, in uh, cybersecurity, and, but I want to take it in a slightly different direction. So right now, you know, law enforcement will uh, take down infrastructure or arrest a bad guy because they decide they don't want a vacation in Russia, uh, which I highly encourage. I think Poland's lovely this time of year, and anybody in Russia who wants to go on vacation in Poland should definitely do that. Um, um, but um, or, or you know or, or or you know they'll 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 sanction a cryptocurrency exchange or whatever, um, and, and you know what everybody says is well, you know it doesn't matter because a new ransomware group will pop up. They'll switch to a different exchange. You know, um, you know they'll they'll build new infrastructure and so on. But the thing is, if you go up to Coney Island once a year and play whack-a-mole, you're never gonna get really good at it. If you wanna be a professional whack-a-mole player, and I've now used this joke in like 10 presentations and somebody pointed out to me, there actually are professional whack-a-mole leagues because of course there are. Um, if you wanna be really good at whack-a-mole, you have to go up to Coney Island every day and pound on those moles for, for you know, hours at a time. And I think we're, that's what we're starting to see from law enforcement now is they're becoming professional whack-a-mole players. So we're not seeing, you know, in the last year, we've seen 32 uh, law enforcement actions against ransomware groups. That's more than in the previous five years combined. So whether that's arrests, whether that's sanctions, whether that's, you know, hacking in and taking down infrastructure, the only thing we haven't seen that I'm still advocating for, if anybody from DHS is here, drone strikes. <laughs> I mean, you take out a country infrastructure, you should get droned, is all I'm saying. And... Some people will say that a cyber crime isn't necessarily worth the death penalty. That's fine. The Russian DMV is very insecure, Department of Motor Vehicles, for those who don't know, is very insecure, and we know that ransom reactors like their fancy cars. Drone strike their car. Let them know you could have hit them, you decided to be nice. Um, I mean, how many 23-year-olds in Russia are buying Lamborghinis? They're either part of the Russian mob or they're ransomware. Either way, if you take out their car, you're sending the message, hey, uh, maybe I should retire early. Um, so I do think that engaging in law enforcement, the, the law enforcement activity that, that's being engaged in is going to have good long-term repercussions. We're just not there yet that I see. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I am not an expert on IoT systems, so I don't want to speak to that. I mean, I'd, I'd reach out to Rob Lee or somebody. Um, if anybody from Dragos is here, I, I'd talk to them. I haven't, see, I haven't seen anything like that, but I don't spend a lot of time on IoT cases. Um, definitely lots of denial of service. I um, mean, it's part of the sort of expanded e extortion ecosystem. Um, you know, we'll launch a DDoS attack against you. Um, you know, for schools, we'll reach out to the parents and let them know that you refuse to pay and that we're going to release their kids' data. And it's your fault that we're releasing the kids' data. Um, uh, but but I, I really can't speak to OT. If anybody here does have any comment on that, you know, I certainly would love to hear that, as I'm sure everybody else would. Oh. Against OT systems. I, I know like snake ransomware a few years ago or ECANS um, um, uh, actually had a list of OT systems that they specifically targeted in, um, uh, as part of their standard uh, operation. Anyone else? Wonderful. Again, thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>